we thank God for that. Some of you may wonder why it is that whenever I come into a pulpit, I get on my knees. My pastor taught me that. I watched him as a boy when he would come into the pulpit of the Enon Church where I was born and raised, and he never came into the pulpit without first bending his knees in prayer. When I started preaching at the age of 17, I asked him, why do you do that? And he said, I bow because I recognize that when I step into the pulpit, I'm not worthy to preach the gospel. He said, I know my frailty, I know my weaknesses, and I ask God to clean up my lips of clay that I might preach his gospel. I never go into any pulpit without getting on my knees. Turn with me very quickly tonight to the 26th chapter of Matthew. And I want to read in your hearing the first, or rather the sixth and seventh verses. Matthew 26, verses 6 and 7. Quickly would you rise for just a few moments. Allow me to read the scripture and then you may return to your seated places. Matthew 26, verses 6 and 7. Succinctly, the scripture reads in the New International Version. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, the leper. You may be seated. In the time that God shall give me tonight, <clears throat> I want to preach about a strange stop before Calvary. A strange stop before Calvary. On Wednesday night when I came first among you, I talked about dreams. I lifted the thought that there ought be in all of us hope and expectation. Whatever dreams God plants in our thinking and in our lives ought to be that which pushes us towards the fulfillment of that dream and beyond the fulfillment of that dream we ought to be pushed towards something called excellence. Anybody who reads the beam of the biblical revelation from the dawning syllable of Genesis to the closing word of the revelation will not find anywhere in its content the word mediocrity. Mediocrity does not exist in the scripture because the Lord does not expect from us mediocrity. The expectation of God is that we would become excellent in whatever field of endeavor we choose, in whatever dreams we fulfill. If I am convinced of anything in life, I am convinced of this. I believe that everybody is born with a purpose. Anybody who does not understand that is somebody who has not really lived life. Socrates said that the chief end of life is to know thyself. That each one of us, from a base black to a treble white, has the responsibility of discovering what it is that God has determined for me when it comes to my destiny. Is it not tragic that there are many people who live and die never discovering what their destiny is. One of the things that we must discover about Jesus Christ is that it was his destiny to come into the world for one purpose and one purpose only. And that purpose 
was to die for our sins. He was a great preacher. He was a great teacher. He was a miracle worker. But ultimately, the purpose for which Jesus came down through 40 and 2 generations was to die upon the brow of Calvary, to shed his blood that you and I might have a right to the tree of life and that we might have it more abundantly. We are now tonight in this 26th chapter of Matthew. And the very fact that we are in the 26th chapter automatically registers in our minds that we are nearing the end of Jesus' earthly tenure. It will not be long now before he will carry that cross down the Via Della Rosa and make his way up Golgotha's brow and there hang upon an old tree that you and I might enjoy this privilege 2,100 years later. I can only imagine that at this juncture, there are many things that are running through Jesus' mind. There are many things that are very much apparent in his spirit. I believe that he can hear the hammering of the nails that will go into his hand. I believe that he thinks about the cold piece of steel that will go through the flesh of his feet. He will think about that plaited crown of thorns that will rivet his brow. He will think about the pointed tip of the Roman centurion spear that will go into his side. Would he not also be thinking about the denials of Peter and the betrayal of Judas? And we don't talk much about it, but what about the lamentations of his mother Mary? who at the foot of the cross would weep because she would look upon that child who had gestated in her womb 33 years ago, knowing now that the purpose for which he had been born is coming to pass. But what I want to concentrate on tonight is the first part of that sixth verse in this 26th chapter where Matthew says that as Jesus is getting ready to die. Now that he is in the very last week of his life, he elects to spend the last days before he goes to Calvary in the house of Simon the leper. What a place to spend your last hours. Why not go back home to Nazareth and feel the warm embrace and the inspiration and encouragement of his family? If not going home, why not go to the synagogue in Nazareth where he had been brought up, where he began his ministry three years before by quoting the lyrical, poetic words of the prophet Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Why not go to the city of Jerusalem? Why not go to the temple there where the sacred feasts of the Jews were held year in and year out? Jesus elects to spend his last remaining days in the house of Simon the leper. What many of us fail to realize about Jesus is that unlike you and I who delight in always taking the easy road, Jesus never took the easy road. He took what Robert Frost calls the road less traveled. And what a marvelous and wonderful poem that is. Frost says, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not take them both and be one travel. Along I stood and looked down as one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, 
two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled, and taking that road less traveled has made all the difference in my life. Perhaps one of the reasons that many of us have never really been fulfilled in our living is because we have traveled the road everybody else traveled. Perhaps we might put it in sociological language and declare that there are so many of us who rather than follow the road that God has destined for us, we have chosen to follow the road of our peers. Peer following is not just something that young people do. Middle-aged and older people travel the road also of their peers. And yet many of us fail to realize that there are certain blessings along the road less traveled that cannot be found along the road that everybody else travels. Name me one great person, somebody who has really made a categorical and definitive difference in life. And I will show you somebody who has traveled the road less traveled. The first thing that I want to suggest to you as I bid you good night is that Jesus goes to the house of Simon the leper because Jesus wants to align himself with the man that he has obviously previously healed. If I were Matthew, I would have not have written it this way. I might well have written it this way, that he went to Bethany and found himself in the house of Simon, the former leper. You've got to insert that word farmer, former, because the fact that Jesus was in the house of Simon, the leper, means that Simon was no longer gripped by leprosy. He had been healed of his leprosy because if he still had leprosy, he would not be in his home. He would not be in the community. He would be in a leper's colony because his disease was contagious. Come on, talk to me. And his disease was infectious. And the very fact that he has been put back in his home is to say that he has experienced the healing But even in the text we read where the stigma of who he used to be. I'm going to preach in a few minutes. The malady that he used to have is still attached to his name. I don't know about you, but one of the harsh things that I've discovered about life is that Negroes will never let you forget who you were. (laughs) And they have no problem always dredging up your past and reminding you of who you used to be. Simon could easily say, I used to be a leper. I was covered with sores from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet. But one day I met a man named Jesus. I wish there was somebody in Huber tonight who really believed that Jesus is Jehovah Rophi, that he is still a God who can heal. I know that we're in 2018, and there are those of you so sophisticated and so educated and so aristocratic that you cannot embrace the idea that God is a healer, but God can heal anybody of anything. God can heal mental illness as well as physical affliction and malady. Something tells me that I've got about 50 folk in here who don't mind at least raising your hand and acknowledging the fact that I know he's a healer because he touched my body. He touched my disease. He touched my illness. Come on, here's the shout. And I'm not ashamed to tell anybody that had it not been for the goodness of the Lord, I would not be here tonight. 
There are always people who want to remind you of who you used to be. I've often wondered, Dr. Smith, how it is that when Jacob wrestled with that angel atop that mountain called Peniel on the night before he was to meet Esau, his brother, after being in Padanaram with his uncle Laban for 20 years. How is it that he wrestled with that angel all night long and God hit him in his thigh and changed his name and said, no longer shall you be called Jacob, but you shall be called Israel. So that technically we ought to be saying Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Y'all are going to get this going home. But we still call him Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because even with a new name, we refuse to let go of who he used to be. And if you don't shout on anything else tonight, you ought to rejoice that you may not yet be what you ought to be, but thank God you are not what you used to be. Does anybody feel like giving God a shout and giving God a praise that I ain't what I used to be? I'm not the liar that I used to be. I'm not the gossip that I used to be. I'm not who I was yesterday when I was in high school. Have you ever read the genealogy of Jesus in the first chapter of Matthew? That when you get down in that genealogy and you read about Solomon's mother, her name is never mentioned by Matthew. Solomon's mother is simply defined as Uriah's wife. As even the gospel writer does not want us to forget that it was the wife of Uriah Bathsheba that David had laid down with. There is something in the human spirit that just won't let us forget who we used to be. And let me help somebody tonight because I want to preach a word of deliverance. Shame on you if you are held captive by who you used to be. Some of y'all been here three nights and you ain't smiled yet. <laughs> your arms are still folded and your legs are still crossed. And you would be surprised at how many people there are in the body of Christ who are still living in their yesterday. But somebody ought to get up tonight and declare, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Let me help somebody. The next time somebody comes up to you and reminds you of who you used to be, what you used to do, and who you used to do it with, don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Don't let anybody put you in the captivity of humiliation. Look them dead in the eye and declare, that's who I used to be. But now let me tell you who I am. <laughs> let me tell you who I am since... Jesus saved my soul. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But, there's that conjunction again, but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the water. I said from the water. I said from the water he lifted me now safe am I. I know you're a member of Huber. I know you're a member of New Shiloh. But that doesn't mean you're saved. <laughs> Somebody ought to say saved by his power divine. I said saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete. Because honey child, I'm saved. Paul said I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do forgetting those things y'all don't know when to shout you don't know when to punctuate the atmosphere with praise forgetting those things which are behind I press can I get a press shout I said I press towards the mark 
of the high calling which is in Christ Jesus. He stopped by the former leper's house so that Jesus might show who he used to be and that the Lord stands with us in who we used to be. Not only does Jesus stand with Simon showing the world that he used to be a leper, but now he's cleansed. Jesus goes to the leper's house, the former leper's house, because there are always people in Bethany, and there are always people around us who really don't believe that the saving and the healing power of Jesus is permanent and not temporary. You and I know people who always believe that what we're going through is not a permanent thing. In fact, there are folk who laughed at you for coming to church tonight. And they're talking about, well, you know, you get caught up in emotion. Honey, it ain't about emotion. This is about reality. I'm talking about what God has done for me, and what God has done for me is permanent. Can I preach? Now, permanent does not mean that I'm perfect. Because even though I'm saved, there are times when I mess up. Okay. Y'all trying to fool these young people. But I want to tell these young people tonight, don't you let these old folk fool you. A whole lot of them are doing what they're doing now because they can't do anything else. And I've discovered at 70 years of age that time will do or grace will do what time won't. Can I get some older folk who will be honest enough to confess that even after I've been saved and healed, I've still messed up. But if I confess my sin, Y'all don't know when to give God glory. Let me back it up, shake it fast, and try it one more time. If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Read your scripture. And you'll discover that when Jesus healed, he healed permanently. He healed the woman with the issue of blood. That was permanent. He healed blind Bartimaeus. That was permanent. He healed the ten lepers. That was permanent. He healed the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. That was permanent. He healed the paralytic lowered through that roof in Capernaum. That was permanent. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. That was permanent. He healed the man with the withered hand. That was permanent. He healed the Gadarene demoniac. That was permanent. And I got a sneaky suspicion that there are some permanent folk in the house tonight. <laughs> through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. Grace brought me safe thus far. And grace shall lead me home. Have you ever heard of an educated fool? One of the conversations that your pastor and I have had in recent memory is the conversation about African Americans who are privilege to go to college, get graduate degrees, even end up with PhD and postgraduate degrees, but stop coming to church. You've got a whole lot of professors out in Morgan who don't go to anybody's church. Coppin State, they don't go to anybody's church. Howard University, my own alma mater, but they don't go to anybody's church as if your intellect is better than your spirituality. Your intellect can't save you. Your intellect cannot heal you. There's a power 
in spirituality that education does not have. Our mothers and our fathers may have never had a degree, but they had a depth of spirituality that made them feel, I feel like preaching now, that if you're hungry, God will put food on your table. That if you're thirsty, God will put water on your tongue. That if you're naked, God will put clothes on your back. I thank God for a mother tonight who sleeps out in the Baltimore National Cemetery, came out of a little place called Ware Neck, Virginia. Never went anywhere beyond grade school, but she put something in my sister and me that Howard University could never put in me. And let me know that God will. I said, God will. I said, God will make a way somehow. Can I get a somehow praise in here? Can I get a witness that God will not only make a way somehow, but God will make a way anyhow. Thomas Jefferson, third president of our republic, ambassador to France. And to be honest with you tonight, I don't know whether Thomas Jefferson is in heaven or hell. What an audacious statement to make. And I'm going to tell you why I made that statement in just a few minutes. See, one of the problems I have is the problem that Early on in my life, I learned how to read. <laughs> and not only did I learn to read, but I learned how to think. Thomas Jefferson decided one day, you know the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence, that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights and among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Wonderful words. He wrote all those words while he was sleeping with Sally Hemmons. He had slaves, but he liked black meat. <laughs> He decided one day, preach Charles Booth, that he would go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that he would take out of the Gospels anything that related to the miraculous or the supernatural. And he reaped or ripped those pages out of the Bible. The virgin birth, he did not believe in it, so he ripped it out of the Bible. The miracles that Jesus performed, the blind that he gave sight to, the dumb that he gave speech to, the deaf that he gave hearing to, the healing that he gave to those who were limb, who had lame limbs, ripped it out of the Bible. And then he did the most damnable thing of all. He got to the resurrection and ripped out of the Bible the fact that on the third day morning Jesus got up from the grave because he did not believe in the supernatural and he went beyond that he ripped out of the Bible the fact that Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and then he ripped out of the Bible the verses that dealt with the second coming of Jesus because none of these things fitted in his understanding of what is rational and what is logical and what is reasonable. Don't you know that God is the most irrational being in the world? That God does not operate within the confines of logic. That's why we shout, because God has done some things that have blown our minds. Stuff that we thought was impossible. God has done. Do I have anybody in here tonight who knows that God has done something impossible in your life? Okay. Y'all want to be cute. 
is there anybody in here who knows that there are some things that have happened in your life that only God could do? That you didn't have the intelligence to do it. You didn't have the money to do it. You didn't have the influence to do it. But you fell down on your knees. And you started hollering, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help do I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, or whither shall I go? And the reason that I said I don't know whether he's in heaven or hell, you thought I forgot where I was. I know where I am. Is <laughs> because the book says anybody who adds to <laughs> preach black man or takes away from what's in this book will have his place taken out of the book of life. I don't know about you, but I want to be in the book of life. I don't know about you, but I want to be ready when he comes back. If I'm dead, I want to rise. If I'm in the water, I want to come out of the sea. And if I'm alive, I want to be caught up to meet him in the air. Does anybody in here believe that he's coming back again? I may not know the day or the hour, but he's coming back again. And when he comes back, I want to be ready. A strange stop before Calvary. But there's a final thing that made Jesus stay at the home of Simon, the former leper. Jesus stayed so that he might stand with Simon to help him, even though there was still stigma attached to his name. He stayed with Simon the former leper because he wanted everybody in Bethany to know that what he had done for Simon was not temporary, but it was permanent. But finally, Jesus had, understood, had, had the understanding that that place, that humble abode, the domicile of a former leper was going to be turned into a church. Don't you know that you can have church anywhere? I feel sorry for some of you who only shout in church, who can only give God praise in the sanctuary. I shout at home. Sometimes when I'm in my car and I just think about how good God is. Uh, I walked around the other day in the Towson Town Center and I thought to myself, I can remember when I didn't have two nickels to rub together. Now I can buy just about anything I want. And I thought even in the middle of the Towson Town Center, I ought to say glory to God. Some of y'all too cute to shout in public. Some of y'all are too cute to give God the praise. But you ought to give God the praise anywhere. In Simon's house. Give me seven minutes and then I'm done. Because I can tell some of y'all can't take too much water. The belief is that Jesus was not by himself. But that there might well have been a dinner party. And that at the dinner party were the 12 disciples, Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead. Don't forget that. And his sisters, Mary and Martha. You will remember that Martha was the cook. And she was the one who was always in the kitchen when Jesus came to Bethany frying the chicken and cooking the collard green. And she got mad with her sister Mary because while Martha was in the kitchen with that rag around her head sweating over that chicken, Mary was sitting at his feet. It was this Mary 
that the text says had an alabaster box of perfume worth a lot of money and she began to anoint him from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. This Mary is not to be confused with the Mary in Luke chapter 7 verse 36. That was another Mary who had gone to the house of Simon the Pharisee. And it was there that this Mary washed Jesus' feet with her hair. The Mary in Luke 7 was a hoe. <laughs> but the Mary here in Matthew 26 is the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And you know, there's always somebody in the church, and this is, of course, it's not here with you, but in many of our churches, trustees are always looking at the money. And somebody among the disciples began to say, why are you wasting that alabaster box of perfume? anointing him. And what I love about Jesus, Brother Bo, is that Jesus checks them. How many of y'all know the Lord will check you? And the Lord looked at whoever said it and said, shut up. She doeth a good thing. Because when you read the Bible, you discover that when Jesus dies on Calvary, there was never time to anoint his body. Which is why the women come early on the third day morning because they want to properly anoint his body for burial. And so Jesus says, leave her alone. And leave her alone because she doeth a good thing. This is a pre-ceremonial experience. She is anointing me because in a few days there will not be time for my anointing to take place because I will be dying. Worship is always about the anointing falling on the house. So that when this woman anoints Jesus with this alabaster box of perfume, that was a sign that God was in the house. I want to believe tonight that God is in the house. Uh, I don't know whether the person ne sitting next to you has the anointing or not, but whether that person has the anointing or not, you ought not be governed by somebody else's behavior. No, no, whether you shout doesn't depend upon whether somebody next to you is shouting or not. You ought to just give God glory and give God praise and give God thanksgiving. And give God appreciation because you know how good the Lord is. But can I peep into the text? Can I spy on the text? I believe, Kelly, that Mary did not just anoint Jesus with that alabaster box of perfume, giving him a pre-burial consecration. But I believe that while she was covering his body, smothering him with that oil so that its rich perfume and its beautiful fragrance would not only go up his nostril, but she turned that whole experience, that dinner party, into a worship experience. And probably while she was anointing him, she probably looked at him and said, I got to thank you. I got to thank you. You took your time coming to Bethany, but, but when you got there and my brother was dead, you raised him from the dead. And I've never had the chance to thank you for raising my brother from the dead. So that worship is not only about the anointing covering the house and the fragrance filling the house, but the anointing is only one part of the worship. Because once anointed, 
And once the fragrance of the anointing fills the house, somebody has got to start thinking or thanking God. See, you got to understand something. Praise and worship are not the same thing. And if you don't get anything else, you go out of here with this. Praise and worship are not the same thing. Praise is what I do for what God has done. But worship is about who he is. <laughs> that if he never does anything at all, I'm going to still worship him because he's God and God all by himself. I wish I had somebody in here who understood what I'm talking about. That even if God does not answer my prayer, I'm going to worship him anyway. Even though the enemy is on my trail, I'm going to worship him anyway. I know it's not Sunday morning, but can I get a Sunday morning worship on a Friday night in Huber? Can you act like it's Sunday morning and worship God just for who he is? Uh, I want to thank him for being wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. I want to thank him for putting food on my table and water on my tongue and clothes on my back and a hat on my head and shoes on my feet. I want to thank him for the job that I had. I want to thank him for the retirement that I enjoy. I want to thank him for healing my body. I want to thank him for making my enemy my footstool. I want to thank him for the joy that's in my heart. Somebody over here ought to thank him tonight. Somebody over here ought to thank him tonight. Somebody over here ought to thank him tonight. And you ought to thank him for what he's getting ready to do. I know what he did in 2017. And I know what he did in 2016. But I'm so glad. I said, I'm so glad that the best is yet to come. Why don't you look at somebody and tell somebody, you think I've shouted. You think I've given God glory. You think I've given God praise. But you just wait until 2018 begins to unfold. I'm going to thank him for the doors he's getting ready to open. I'm going to thank him for the mountains I'm getting ready to climb. I'm going to thank him for the valleys I'm getting ready to go through. I'm going to thank him for the tears he's getting ready to wipe away. I wish I had 25 folk who don't mind standing in the aisle and telling God right now, I'm giving you an advanced praise, an advanced shout. Does anybody feel like thanking God in advance for all he's getting ready to do? You ought to praise God that he's able to still blow your mind. If he did it yesterday, he'll do it today. And if he does it today, he'll do it tomorrow. Open your mouth. Throw up your hands. Look unto the hills from whence cometh your help. And say, thank you, Lord. For all you've done. You know what you ought to thank him for? You ought to thank him for stuff that he's done that you don't know anything about. You ought to thank him that you didn't fall in the ditch that the devil had dug for you. You ought to thank God that virus didn't get you. That bacteria didn't get you. I want to thank him for all the stuff he's done for me that I don't know anything about. Why don't you holler thank you? Why don't you shout thank you? Why don't you shake somebody's hand like you're getting ready to shake it off? 
and tell somebody he didn't have to do it, but he did. He didn't have to make a way, but he did. He didn't have to open a door, but he did. He didn't have to lead me in green pastures, but he did. He didn't have to lead me in paths of righteousness, for, but he did. Thank you. Thank you. I don't deserve it, but thank you. Anyhow. Maybe. Just maybe. 2018 is the year that God wants to bless you for taking the road less traveled. When somebody tells you you're crazy for doing that, take the road less traveled. When somebody looks at you and tells you it makes no sense, take the road Rest, less traveled. There's a blessing going down the road that everybody else is scared to go down. You want God to bless you in 2018? Don't go down the center road. Go down one of the roads less traveled. The week before he died, he spent time in the house. Simon. The former leper. You know what that tells me? That if I had been living, he might have stayed in my house. <laughs> that he might not have stayed in a house with a three-car garage. You said it, Brother Bo, but maybe he'll stay in one of them starter houses. A strange stop. See, that's why some people cannot really appreciate those of us who give way to uncontrollable shouts. Because you don't know how good the Lord's been. Listen, and how I trusted him going down the road that everybody else told me not to go down. Because when it doesn't make sense, that's when God is at his best. Didn't make any sense for Daniel to go in that lion's den, but he went in there. Didn't make any sense for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to go in that fire, but they went in there. Didn't make any sense for Paul, Silas, to go in that Philippian jail sense jail cell but they went in there yeah. didn't make any sense for Bunyan to go in that Bedford jail but he went in there I'm going where he tells me to go look at somebody and tell them I'm going down the road let's travel I've decided to make Jesus my choice. Come on, get up on your feet. Oh, the road is rough, and the going gets tough. Hard to climb. The door of the church is open. Somebody's been here all three nights. 
and you have been dickering with the idea to come. Come on. I've decided to make Jesus my joy. Say it again. Say it again. Oh, that road gets rough. The road and the going and the hill. In my mind, I've decided every head is bowed, every eye is closed, every head is bowed.